Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest made a name for himself appearing in shows like Lucifer, Rizzoli and Isles, and The Client List, but a life in the arts uh, was something Colin Egglesfield never anticipated, nor did he or could he anticipate the ups and downs that come with life in general. In his new book, Agile Artist, Egglesfield details his personal triumphs and tragedies and how he's managed a creative life. Everybody, please put your hands together for Colin Egglesfield. Let's hear it. Hey! Thanks for having me, Ricky. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you know, a, a fair amount of, the, of this book is how you made time for being a creative person, but you never considered yourself an artist. You didn't really even think that you could be one. So take me back to a moment when you realized you may, in fact, have been one. Uh, it was when I stepped into my first acting class. Uh, so growing up in the Midwest, pretty much the lifestyle is, you know, you're expected to go to school and get married and get the job and have the kids and... Uh, when I was going to school at University of Iowa, I studied biology pre-med, and so I'd go to my biology classes, but then I would also go to my art classes because I was always into art and wanted to be creative, but I never really thought that I could make having a creative career as a profession. So it wasn't until I jumped into uh, an acting class here in New York, just kind of by happenstance, that uh, I finally discovered that there was a possibility of actually being creative and having an artistic um, career by melding the two in the sense that before that I, uh, I just never was really exposed to the arts in, in terms of like I didn't know any professional artists growing up, I didn't know any professional actors, so it was just kind of out of the realm of what I was used to. So I think what really helped me was, and what I talk about in my book Agile Artist, is if you step out of your comfort zone and start taking risks you actually can start getting exposed to things that you wouldn't normally be exposed to that can open up uh, brand new worlds for yourself. Why uh, Agile Artist? So the reason I chose Agile Artist as the title is because as an actor, we have to be incredibly agile going from job to job to job. Um, not only that, but in today's day and age, I meet so many people who have a side hustle. They've got a main job or they're going to school, but then they've got like three or four other gigs on the side. So a lot of what I talk about is what I've learned in my acting classes in terms of how to, how to adapt to uh, change, how to adapt to rejection, because as actors, we go on so many auditions. And uh, I've done the calculations, and it's kind of crazy. I've gone on over 2,000 auditions in my 20-year acting career. And if you go on IMDb, you'll see that I've done a little over 40, 40 projects. Mm -hmm. So that equates to like a 2% success rate. So like I fail 98% of the time, and that's that's pretty much the, the norm for I, most actors, unless you're like Leonardo DiCaprio. I would say DiCaprio a two percent <laughs> success rate, a two percent success rate in acting is probably above at like far above average. It's it's kind of crazy when you really look at it, and so you could either look at it from a perspective of I fail 98% of the time, or I'm successful 100% of the time because. All from that 98% failure, I, I learned something from every single audition that I've gone on. And it's that 2% that has allowed me to make movies with Sylvester Stallone that I just did last year, kiss Kate Hudson, do movies in Thailand and Cape Town, South Africa. So when people see me, they're like, man, you're successful. You've done all this amazing stuff. And what they really don't know is that it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Have you ever had a moment over the course of your 20 years as, a, 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 as an actor where you didn't think you should do it anymore? You thought oh, yeah. that you should throw, the, throw in the towel? And yeah, yeah. And that's what I talk about in the book, too, is that uh, if you go after something in life, you have got to love it down to the core of who you are uh, because it's anything you pursue is just going to be too difficult and you're going to fail because of it. So one of the things I talk about is finding your hell yeah. And that hell yeah is if you, whether it's a job or a relationship, if it's not a hell yeah, if you, if you can't ask yourself, like, is this a hell yeah? If you can't say yes to that, then it should be a no because you're going to be wasting your time and you're going to be filling up the space and not allowing that hell yeah to then eventually come into your life. So for me, growing up, I studied biology pre-med thinking I was going to go to medical school. And I was just kind of feeling like, well, this is, a, I guess, what I'm supposed to be doing. And it was so frustrating in college, just feeling like some of my friends kind of really found out what they really liked. Like some of my friends were into engineering and, you know, I, I started out engineering and three-dimensional ve vector calculus was like, okay, this is not for me. And some of my friends would be geeking out about the coefficient of friction. I'd be like, you know what, this is just not, this isn't resonating with me. Um, 
And so it wasn't until I just randomly heard on the, the radio about this model talent search where I found myself in Milan, Italy doing fashion shows. And I was like, well, I'll just kind of do this for a couple of years and then I'll go to medical school. And then I found myself here in New York City, uh, jumped into the acting class. And it wasn't until then that I really found what my true hell yeah was. Um, you didn't want to be a doctor who was a former model? Uh, n well, the thing was, it's like... After that's I, a kind of cool thing, too. Well, so my dad was a doctor as well, and I was kind of thinking he might be disappointed that I didn't go you know, down that route. But I did end up getting to play doctor on all my children, soap opera. So <laughs> I kind of got to fulfill that, check that, that off the checkbox. I just imagine a lot of like middle-aged women going, ooh, Dr. Egglesfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. and, and that's the thing. It's like I, I kind of always just figured uh, it, it would eventually happen. I, I never really thought this would kind of keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I guess to answer to your question, um, yeah, there's been several times where I would, uh, after failed audition, uh, I would just go back into my car and, like, bang my head on the steering wheel. Like, why the hell am I putting myself through this, this like, rejection and this much torture? But Well, not just rejection, though. I mean, when you're an actor and you're coming up, you have to take jobs as an actor that you don't necessarily might not elicit that hell yeah. How did you how did you find that hell yeah when maybe you were taking a part that was extremely small like or cappuccino was, guy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you just in my mind you, you, you kind of have to pay your dues. The cappuccino guy is like the best version that, of that. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're like um, a dead body. I played a male escort uh, on Law and Order SVU. That was my first role actually. Wow. Um, and uh, you that's know, kind of a hell yeah moment. That's though. kind of a hell yeah moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when Mariska Haggerday is coming up to you and asking if you've like been with this couple and I'm about to uh, go up and get my, you know, my throat slit and she saves my life. So that was a pretty special moment in my acting career. Um, and I've played a vampire, which it seems like most <laughs> actors have had, you know, their vampire moment. Um, but for the most part, I've always looked at it as uh, an experience and something that I could learn from. And uh, uh, there are there have been a couple of roles that uh, that I have turned down, but um, for the most part, it's hard for me to say no because I just love to do it so much. And uh, and so it's yeah, I mean, it really is hard to say no. Do you find that you love by. to do it whether you love the part or not or love the project? You still are just so excited to get the chance to do this thing. Yeah, pretty much. So like even with like all my children, as crazy as soap operas can be sometimes. Uh, a lot of people actually questioned why I would accept going on a soap opera. And if you know, if you meet some acting teachers, they'll be like, "I dare you to try to get a soap opera. I dare you to try to get any acting job." And sometimes there's this elitist attitude that, like, "Oh, they poo-poo some of the jobs that you do." But I mean, you look at any big actor out there, I guarantee you, they've done something when they were first starting out. Of where they just were like, you know what? I just want to get on set. I want to see what this is like. I in no way uh, poo-poo uh, soap operas. I don't necessarily watch them myself, but mad respect to actors doing soap operas. You have to learn a lot of lines oh very quickly, God, yeah. and the emotions that you play run the gamut every yeah. day. You're doing, you are acting. That is a lot of acting that goes into doing soap oh, yeah. operas. Yeah, it's, uh, so I talk about in the book the difference between soap opera acting and prime time and film acting. So with a, a regular film, you're, they're usually filming maybe like three to five pages a day. Uh, with primetime television, they'll shoot maybe eight to 12 pages a day. Um, and with soap opera, we're filming 60 to 80 pages a day. So as an actor, you're having to memorize like 20 pages every day. Do you get prompter? Are there car cue cards or no, anything with it? No, so, nothing. And you're live, essentially, right? Are, are you live to tape? Uh, not live, but they only because they have to blow through so much material, yeah. you're really only allowed one or two takes. And uh, I just... Right, if you can't hack it, like, I mean, you're not going to be on the show. Yeah, no, you're, like, you're gone because yeah. they just they don't have the time. Wow, so that's yeah. high stress. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I just remember when I first got on there, I was doing a scene with Susan Lucci, who played my she mother. She was just here a couple days ago. Was she really? Yeah. How'd she look? Amazing. Yeah? She's 72. She's, yeah, she's She crazy. looks incredible. So I played her transplanted, unaborted fetus son on All My Children. <laughs> Um, you know what I mean? Soap operas kind yeah. of rule. Like, yeah. That's amazing. So, like, when do, you, when do you ever get to do that? So, when she, she was married 11 times on the show, and her first husband, she got pregnant. So, back in the 70s, this was a real storyline where she had an abortion. So, fast forward 30 years after 
they've run through all the storylines out there. They're like, oh, you know what? Let's go back and revisit the abortion thing. Let's, instead of her having the abortion, let's make it where the doctor that supposedly did the abortion was in love with her and stole the fetus and implanted it into his wife. So I was the stolen fetus, and I was born of this doctor and his wife thinking they were my real parents, but Erica was really my biological mother. So uh, That sounds like so much fun. It was amazing. It's yeah, it was surreal. great. It's craziness. I mean, why would I don't understand why something like American Horror Story gets so much more love and respect than right? something like All My Children when that's literally a plot line out of American Horror Story. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I just remember being on set and I had this big long monologue to do. And uh, I mean, with soap opera, they pretty much just throw you in the deep end, expect you to to learn how to swim. And I just could not get through this monologue. So they were like, here, here's the script. Just read the lines. We're going to put the camera on Susan this whole time. And then we'll cut back to you and just hide the script behind your back. So we had to do that. <laughs> so did you, How did you feel about that? I mean, you're just sweating bullets because you're like, all right, am I going to get fired, you know, tomorrow? But yeah. um, they were like, this actually is something that we do all the time, every day with people. It's funny because the, the actress who played the mother on that 70s show, her first job, I think, was on All My Children or a Soap, and she came back to do a guest star on there. And this was after she did the 70s show. And she Becky was in her name. Her, or maybe I'm thinking of the mom in Freaks and Geeks as Becky's. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, and she was just like, ah, oh, man, I don't know how you guys do this. I forgot how nerve-wracking this is. Wow. So You know, one of the other things that you talk about in the book is your, uh, your battle with cancer. Mm. And uh, talk, tell, me, tell me about that. What did it feel like at that time? Because when you're an actor and you're an art, I mean, and you're an artist and you're an actor, you don't have that much stability in a lot of ways. So yeah. what was it like to battle something like that while not having as much sort of like, I mean, career stability as one might want yeah. at that point? So I think one of the things that helped me go through my whole cancer experience was a lot of the stuff that I've learned in my acting classes. And this is why one of the reasons why I wrote the book in the sense that um, as actors, we have to learn how to create our own reality when we walk into an audition or when we're walking on set. And so I'd been studying acting for eight years, all excited, booked all my children, my first steady acting job, come back here to New York City. And six months later, I get diagnosed with cancer. And it was testicular cancer, so it was not something I wanted to tell people about because it's a private guy thing, you know. Um, and what really got me through it was recognizing that um, as an actor, I started to adopt who do I need to, what character do I need to become, and what role do I need to, to take on in order to get through this in an empowering context. Because you can look at the statistics from any medical you know, ailment and look at and say, look, well, my chance of survival is 85%. And then your brain will latch on to that negative. So I just, I didn't want to look at any of the negative stuff or focus on any of that. I decided, because this is what we do as actors every day, focus on what I needed to create within myself in order to create an empowering context to, to get me through it. So for me, it was, and this is one thing that I, I have, uh, I want to give a, a lot of credit to my mom um, because my cancer came back again a year later. It was just a terrifying experience because um, at this point you're like, okay, I had it once, surgery, radiation. It comes back again, and you're like, okay, I just went through a year of hell, and now I got to deal with this again. And you know, can I ask because yeah. this is I was reading I was reading in the book you 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 were going to get tested to find out whether or not it spread. Did it come back in the same area or had it spread a little bit? It it came back on the other side. Right. So it hadn't spread up the lungs, which is where you don't want it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but it came back to the other side, and which was puzzling to the doctors. So no one knew what the problem was. So there were no answers. So, And that's what I talk about in, in the book, is that you can let the fear of the unknown cripple you. And, and I called my mom up, and I was like, I was just, you know, I was terrified after I got the second diagnosis. And she was like, honey, y you got to you got to become a warrior right now. You got to put on your battle armor and go to and go to battle. And as an actor, I was like, you know what? You're right. I just need to become a warrior. I need to get through this. And uh, what really helped me get through it was the support of my community. And that's what I talk about in the book as well, it, uh, especially as men, because we're, it's hard for us to necessarily be vulnerable and, and admit our weakness. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, as soon as I I started to share my experience with people my community showed up and, and I recognized that there is strength and vulnerability 
And that's another re reason why I wrote, wrote the book, because I do a lot of charity work with St. Jude's Hospital, so I meet a lot of kids and families that are going through similar experiences that I was going through, and, and just knowing what they went through in terms of like how, how you know, scary that can be, um, I just kind of have shared a lot of the experiences that I've gone through and my mindset and how I got through it. And, uh, and so that's why, I, another reason why I'm, I'm really proud of this, because in a lot of ways already, people have shared their experiences with me and said, you know what, you've given me the strength to get through whatever I'm dealing with. Did you find, though, as much as you were taking on this character, this, this warrior character, there is still you underneath that, and that yeah. sometimes you have to take off the mask? And did yeah. you find that at times it was still that that mask would slip off and you would oh, get yeah. really vulnerable I mean, and, and yeah, nervous definitely and worried. You have your breakdowns and yeah. times where you're just like, you know, you're screaming up to God or whoever and you're just like, why, why, why? Mm. Um, but inevitably it was always like, you know what? Um, it's, it's I, I still look around and I see that there's other people going through a lot of similar stuff. So sometimes we can get stuck in our own head that, you know, it's why me, why me? And as soon as, we, as soon as we start to look outside of ourselves and recognize that there's other people going through similar experiences, um, or like when any, like when I'm, even just when I'm having a bad day nowadays, um, all I need to do is just kind of, uh, a, a really good exercise that one of my uh, um, mentors taught me was to just a gratitude journal. Mm -hmm. That no matter yeah. how bad Wake up your in the life morning is. And write three things down that you're Yeah, like I do it at thing. night before I go to bed. Oh, good. Um, but no matter how bad your life is, if you just sit down and write three things that you're grateful for, I mean, it, it immediately can shift your perception and your mindset. Yeah, it changes your mindset. I mean, yeah. maybe not the whole day, but you can right. at least for me when I do that in the morning, it yeah. definitely is like a, a it, it helps to just kind of like, it's like a good breath that right. allows you to move forward a little bit faster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question right here? Hi. Hi. Um, what life experience do you cherish most and what is in your bucket list? Oh, uh, I would say the life experience I cherish most is being able to work with some of the, mo the most incredible artists in the world. Like one of my first experiences uh, was working with Giorgio Armani and it's actually his birthday today and I did a post and, and what I recognized was with him is that, um, you know, being in, in the presence of greatness where he's like personally fitting, you know, a suit on me, and um, and just seeing the way that he uh, approaches his work, um, working with Sylvester Stallone, working with Gary Oldman, um, just some of these like super incredibly successful people. And uh, what were you shooting with uh, Stallone? Uh, I shot a movie called Backtrace. Oh, okay. And it came out like three months ago, I want to say. Okay. So we're detectives, and uh, it has Matthew Modine and. Um, I mean, so to be on set with... Yeah, what was it know, like being on set it was with incredible. Stallone? I mean, it like... He owns the set, I imagine. Oh, yeah. He yeah. runs the show. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And like when I was eight, nine years old, when I came home from seeing Rocky, I literally jumped out of the car and ran around the block because I was like, you know, after he runs up the stairs in Philadelphia, I was like, oh, I want to be Rocky. And then like 30 years later to be on set working with him was incredible. Um, and so I guess to answer your second question, what, what's on my bucket list... Um, I still want to have a family, um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, I felt like I just had to push the reset button in Los Angeles because um, I kind of felt like I'd been there for the past 10 years, and I started to feel like it was getting a little stale and going into my auditions um, with a bit of a chip on my shoulder that because I'd already done all this stuff, uh, I was just getting tired of running and getting on that, that hamster wheel of going in and auditioning, auditioning, auditioning. And so another thing I talk about in my book is that if you're feeling stuck in a situation or in, in, your, in your environment, sometimes you just need to remove yourself from it, get a fresh start, push the reset button. So I recently moved back to my hometown of Chicago and immediately within like two weeks of moving back there, I booked an independent film that's gonna be coming out next year. I did a couple episodes of Chicago Fire, uh, shot a TV pilot, and I'm about to shoot a uh, reality real estate TV show in Chicago because I also do some some real estate in Chicago. As well. That and uh, doing real estate, I mean, that is a part of being an agile agile artist. Yeah. I would imagine as well. That's a yeah. huge part of it. Yep, exactly. So you know, especially with acting, uh, most everyone I know has their hands in so many different things. Um, and uh, and I guess 
to just kind of piggyback on that with the, the title of the book, Agile Artist, um, I meet so many people who are in a place in their life where they're looking to change it or they're looking for some more fulfillment in their life, whether they're uh, changing jobs or they're getting out of a relationship and looking for a new one. And change can be very scary. And so I talk about how to be as agile as possible, especially nowadays where the world moves at hyper speed. And then uh, one of the, the really amazing things I've learned as an actor is that being, uh, bringing creativity into your life can help complement, bring fulfillment, and solve a lot of problems that you're dealing with. Um, I talk about in the book left brain analytical side, right brain creative side, and a lot of times when we're dealing with a problem or a situation, we just try to like figure it out with that analytical, okay, how, how can I figure this out? And a lot of the times, if we just step away from the problem, and we go for a run or go on vacation or just, you know, remove yourself from the situation. You let that right brain creative side kind of noodle on it. And that's usually when the situation or the, the solutions to your problems pop up. Yeah. So uh, one more question. Right here. Hey. I want to say thank you for being so vulnerable in your book. And I wanted to know, because I'm a person that lives with cerebral palsy, and for the past couple of years, I've been more open with it. So just to see you be open with your, your story, I wanted to know, when did you feel like you needed to sit down and write this and put it out there for people? Good question. And uh, I just want to let you know that uh, I appreciate you sharing that, too, because you know I'm sure that it's not an easy thing to talk about and admit. And... Uh, for me, it, it, it was hard because as an actor in the spotlight, I didn't want people to identify me with cancer. I wanted them to just appreciate me for my, my acting and, and, uh, and not be distracted by any, any of that other stuff. Um, I think I'm at a point in my life now where I feel like because I do quite a bit of charity stuff and I do meet a lot of people who are going through different health issues, um, and what really got me through my experience, too, was at the time I read Lance Armstrong's book and how he had gone through his cancer battle, and that gave me the strength to, to keep moving forward. So I know how important it is to have someone that you can just go to and relate to and uh, who kind of knows what you're going through. Because some people can be like, oh, you're going to be okay. You'll be fine. Just stay positive. And I want to punch those people in the face because uh, you don't know what it's really like. Um, and in the book, I talk about how after I was diagnosed the second time at Sloan Kennery Hospital, uh, I randomly got into a taxi cab, and you know, I mean, I was just, I, I was, I was terrified. And the cab driver asked me, you know, how I was doing, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing so good. And he was like, Why? What's wrong? And I said, uh, You know, in, in this moment of vulnerability, I just said, I, I just found out I have cancer again. And he looked at me in the rearview mirror and. He just zeroed in on me, and I don't know if this guy was, like, sent from heaven or God or whatever. He, he just looked at me for a second. We were at a stoplight, and in this thick Russian accent, he, he just looked at me, and he goes, you're going to be okay. And I still remember that day because uh, it was terrifying, and I was like, how do you know that? And he goes, because you're young, and I can, I can see it in your eyes. And, and I said, yeah, but you, you say that with such conviction. And he said, well, I have cancer myself. And I said, really? I said, what kind? He said, I have, I have prostate cancer. And I said, are you, so are, you, are you getting treatment for it? And he said, nope, I can't afford it. And I'm driving this taxi to earn money for my family. And I don't know if that guy's still alive. But in that moment, he gave me the strength to recognize that, you know what? He knows exactly what I'm going through. And that's why I feel like it's important that I share what I went through because until you've actually gone through something, you don't know what it's like. And whatever it is that you're going through, um, I mean, to me, you look like it's, you're not letting it stop you. I mean, you're here. I met you out front. You had the biggest smile on your face. And you don't look like anyone who that anything is going to stop you. And that's what inspires me. And I'm sure that inspires your family and everyone else around here. So you keep being you, because you being here right now inspires a ton of people. 
Cullen. The book is uh, in stores now. Yeah, give him a round of applause for that. Yeah. Uh, the book is in stores now. People can pick it up. Yeah, Barnes and Noble and Amazon.com. And what's amazing is that uh, it's funny because my mom <laughs> called me up the other day. She was like, Colin, have you seen the reviews on Amazon? And I was like, yeah, so far we've got uh, like 27 reviews on there, and they're all five star reviews. Oh, great. So they're, it's amazing to see that something that I've, because I've never written a book before. Yeah. Um, and my mom was like, Do you see those reviews? They're actually pretty good. I was like, <laughs> as if like she was surprised that her son could actually do something like this. I was like, thanks a lot, mom. Yeah. But um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's been very well received, and uh, it's, I'm incredibly proud of it. Well, congrats, man. Colin Egglesfield, everybody. Let's hear it. Thank you.